This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios for this episode of Security Matters Hawaii. Today we have an amazing guest, Dr. Flo Falai is going to, jo going to join us from the Hybrid Leadership Institute. And uh, he is also a fellow of, uh, of the Institute of Information Management and many, many credentialed a global expert on leadership and I think a global student of leadership as well as you'll find. And uh, our industry, the security industry in particular, is flexing through leadership changes. So uh, I want to welcome Dr. Flo Falai and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we, we need all the leadership help we can get. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Great. Um, go ahead and uh, I guess brief our audience a little bit on um, as much of your history as you'd like to share. Give them uh, a little sense of yourself. Oh, I'd love to. Um, so, once again, glad to be here. And um, as a world background, I actually uh, function now as the founder of the Hybrid Leadership Institute. We are doing research and providing content and information around. Uh, a, what I call a different way of leading people, especially diverse people. And when I talk about diverse people, I'm talking about perspective, I'm talking about expectation, I'm talking about people who have different ways of working and different ways of really coming and showing up in the offices or in the businesses. And, and one key thing that drives that difference is the what I call the cultural element. Uh, there is a lot that goes with how many of us are raised, how we were raised, where we were raised, uh, with what we were raised, and all of those things really influence and affect and, uh, and really shape how we lead, act, and behave as individuals. So that's on one side, and the other side of my work is also around executive culture at Salon Consulting, which is based here in the United States. Um, one of the things uh, that we do in that space is actually helping leaders like yourself, like your listeners who really are looking to continue to improve what they're doing and need to maximize their value in their respective industry and really challenge them to think and consider different perspectives that perhaps they're, they're not comfortable with or they haven't considered at all. So that's in a nutshell kind of what I do. <laughs> I think when we get into the conversation, we'll, we'll talk some more about my background and family and what have you uh, if you have time. Excellent, excellent. I um, I can tell you that it uh, we we have a phenomenon in, in, in our industry where um, too too many old guys and and, and I'll, I'll I'll get to the problem that I think we have with that. I think in the second half, but you have um a a, um, a perspective that really caught my eye in hybrid leadership and and the idea that uh, especially people from a, a maybe multicultural backgrounds who are bringing a different type of thought because they're able to think multiculturally at one time on a problem and that that perspective is something that's available to us today but we're perhaps not leveraging enough. Um, could you give us some some of the background of, of where that came from and um, some of your experience with, with those ideas? Absolutely. Um, so I call myself a hybrid and I think for, for those who are listening and are wondering what does it mean to be a hybrid? I, I simply say it means to be at least a product of more than one culture, and in many instances, you're functioning uh, without even a sense of awareness of which of the cultural uh, influences that work. Uh, a good example is a hybrid car, for example. Uh, for some people who are wondering, what example can I use to equate that to? I'll talk about a hybrid car. When a car, a hybrid car, for example, a Toyota Prism or any of the green uh, eco-friendly vehicles are in motion or in use, you, the driver, or perhaps you, you, the passenger, might have an idea of which mode you're in. You might be in an electric or you might be in cars, but those on the outside do not have any inkling or any idea which mode is actually at work. And the question really is, why is that important? The analogy that I use in leadership is that there are many individuals in our respective spaces who are like hybrid vehicles. They've got different modes at play. You don't see that, right? Because mm. you're looking to move from one point to the next point or next place, A to B. So you're focused on just transportation. But there is a process of transportation that's actually within. Now, there is mm. an awareness, for example, for someone who's into green technology about protecting the climate. So 
there is more to that individual than just driving a car. So that's ah. sort of the idea around hybrid principle that there is certain of there are certain values that are very critical and important to the individual that really show up or inform their decisions. And if you as a leader uh, is able to talk into that, is able to understand what is moving people, what emotional dimension, what cultural input, what uh, perhaps passion and intimate, strong, passionate desire they have within them, that is by virtue of their training, their culture in particular, that is informing their leadership, it actually positions you as an individual, as a leader of an organization, to be able to get more from people than you probably would have if you did not have any awareness of that uh, particular individual's um, capability or, or even interest. So that's where that came from. So I, I went ahead and did a whole uh, study for my uh, postgraduate, my PhD, around, and I did my dissertation on that premise of um, hybrid leadership. Everybody talks about global leadership. Everybody talks about global citizenship. But there's a dimension to that that is very vital. You know, and that's where I, I researched that element of culture. And I was able to deduce from my research that it does play a significant role in how people show up, how people work, how people think, how people engage. And if we tap into that, that's an amazing uh, bank of information and goodwill that will enable us to do much better than we probably would have done if we just uh, I remain blind or afraid or envious. Mm. Um, to some of those uh, factors. Um, Was that helpful? Yeah, very much so. Do you um, do you think that um, I, I will call it uh, hybrid? Do you think hybrid leaders, or did did you come across data that indicated um, they had a higher levels of people talk about uh, emotional intelligence? Uh, people yeah. talk about empathy. Do you think they have a, a just a broader perspective of those types of ideas because? Elements of, of of maybe multiple cultures are in, are you know involved in their processing of information that's coming at them. Yes, absolutely. In fact, the data and the research shows that um, in many instances they're able to actually display a higher level of empathy. Okay. They're also able to display a higher level of emotional intelligence. In fact, according to the data, we saw that when people actually gravitate into spaces, uh, I, in our research, I, I found that they act almost like a chameleon. You know, a chameleon huh. actually steps to an environment and shifts to become like. So a hypothetical scenario uh, is, for example, if uh, you, let's assume that you are, for example, of two culture. When you get into, and you're coming into a space with those dual cultural uh, dimensions within you. When you get into the state where one culture is perhaps predominant over the other, you have got and adapt to the dominant culture. Mm. Because to, to, uh, to present the other culture is not to show a sign of weakness, right? So you show your strength by adapting to the predominant culture. Huh. The good news is that don't remain in only in that state. You have a, what we call a secondary culture of play, and you're able to actually either bring deeper thoughts, deeper uh, focus, and perhaps broader viewpoints to the conversation that you probably won't even have because you are either monocultural or exposed to only one particular uh, disposition. So the research supports that. And the approach uh, uh, to really how they act or how hybrid, I call myself a hybrid leader, how we act under those scenarios is amazing. In an American environment, you become more American. In a, say in a British environment, you adapt to more of these bridges. And you're able to read people's perspective, you're able to glean uh, just emotionally uh, the energy in the room and be able to adapt appropriately. So you're spot on. The hybrid phenomenon is fascinating to observe. Uh, it does mean that there's a high level of awareness, self-awareness, and also a high level of being able to read an environment and be a type of people. Hmm. You know, I, it, it brings to mind, um, I, I wonder if um, hybrid leaders, uh, you know, when they're acting perhaps in a room, let's say an American room, but they also have a British perspective of themselves, like, you know, the, the whole thing of, of, of being outside yourself and looking. So is there like a, I remember from, from Jamesian psychology, like co-conscious states. I wonder 
If, yeah. Is that going on? Like, a, is there a little, not necessarily a conflict, but a, an awareness that uh, someone who isn't multicultural wouldn't have in a, just during dialogue or making a statement or even listening to others that, wow, my American brain thinks this while my other one thinks that at the same time. Yeah. So, so I love how you, how you post that because for, for me, and I'll use my personal example, when I was going through this, I was looking and writing uh, my research also from a participant's uh, perspective. Okay. So I also go through this phenomenon and I struggle sometimes in capturing all those emotional, uh, even within myself. Uh, and you know, the struggle that we have with that is this idea of authenticity. Okay. You know, you ask the question around, because I'm able to adapt, am I authentic? Because I'm able to flex. Am I, am I valid? Am I, yeah. am I being sincere? Right? And so people question that, both within and also without. And uh, what has happened is that with more understanding of this perspective, and, uh, and, and also the phenomenon, people have become more comfortable in that out-of-body experience that you alluded to, where ah. you step back and ask yourself, who is that guy, right? Or who is this <laughs> girl acting and speaking this way? And then you step back and you realize that you're projecting this particular dimension of yourself, and you're being authentic in that dimension, and if you have to pivot to a different one, you're also being authentic. And it's a very stimulus. It's almost an automatic brain switch wow. that is going on, uh, which is quite fascinating as well. We saw this as we looked at expatriates who have spent significant time away from their home, home country and have assimilated into a new culture. They went, and this is one way to measure, is that when they go back to where they came from, they see more and they sense more and they are more aware. So they become more, either more tolerant, they're more... Um, they're able to deal with more ambiguity. They're able to actually understand differences in a broader scale. And it's not that you're losing yourself, it's that you're enhancing yourself mm. to become really better than what you were before. Yeah, I think of I, I think of the idea of having a sort of a three hundred and sixty degree view of things, but then having it twice. Like yeah. you know, if you're if you're yeah. in, the, in the center of the ball, looking in all directions, but then there's like another ball, or you can move between the balls. I don't, or, or if yeah. it's occurring at the same time, I guess they're, you know, like this, and you're inside both. So, looking at any one yeah. thing through two perspectives at one time, it's it's yeah. uh, it's it's, and, uh, it's a gift, it's I think. Yeah. <laughs> it is, and I think the more the more you become aware of it, the better position we become. Right, so in, in my leadership and executive coaching uh, practice and, and profession, we do a lot of 360 degree feedback. I love how you brought that up because it's a very powerful tool that allows you to see yourself from the angle that you can see. So it gives you kind of a line of sight into your blind spot, is what that is supposed to do. The same still applies, right? Where even though I see myself in a uh, in different dimension in terms of engagement. Uh, there's still blind spots uh, that exist because you can't see everything sure. perfectly. Sure. Uh, and so when leaders, and it doesn't matter what industry, and specifically we're focused on the security industry, I think the amazing opportunity that exists in this space as well is that when we engage people, we need to also understand that people are not just monodimensional, they're not just one-dimensional, right? They're not just one lens, don't we we'll try to solve all the problems with, if I release this product or this part, it fixes X. Yeah. Right? Does it fix Y, Z? Does it fix the entire globe? And to look at what are the vulnerabilities that might exist across a myriad of, of its spectrum, right? Or a, yes. a vast spectrum of options. So uh, it's a very fascinating uh, uh, topic, and I, I can talk about this all day long, right? As you can tell. So I'll pause this. Good. We are. We are. I'll tell you what we will do. We'll take a, a one minute break and we're going to come back and we're going to get into this some more. We'll be back in just a moment. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I'm getting older. Do I need to worry about falling? 
Yes, you do. Each year, one in four people 65 and older will experience a fall, and many will be serious. The majority of falls happen at home, so remove things that could make you trip and install handrails to keep you steady. To learn more about the steps you can take to help prevent a fall, please talk to your doctor. You can also visit aarpfoundation.org or medicaremadeclear.com slash falls. This message was brought to you by United Healthcare and AARP Foundation. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m. and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Hey, Aloha, and welcome back to this episode of Security Matters Hawaii. We're with Dr. Flo Falai from the Hybrid Leadership Institute. And I want to going to take some of these concepts we've been discussing and kind of, I'm going to kind of beat up my industry a little bit, the security industry. Um, I, I was talking with um, Dr. Flay yesterday and I was telling him how I go to security conferences around the country um, and they're full of a room that looks like bowling balls. Old, bald-headed guys who've been in the industry for 40 years. They, they all sit around and agree with themselves about everything and knowledge is hard to move forward. You know, the the cybersecurity, um, mer you know, the merging or the light layer of cybersecurity on, on the physical security industry has been a problem for many of them to adopt. Just for example, um, they've known about the problem for years but not done anything. So um, paralysis can occur in leadership when you have too much agreement, not enough variability, not enough diversity of thought. Um, and our industry has been growing its gender diversity a bit, you know, they, and they're, they're proud to, we've got, 5% women when we had none, okay? So I don't, I don't consider that a, a gain yet. You know, when it's 50-50, I'll say we got somewhere. But um, in this realm of hybrid leadership, um, what do you think our, our industry leadership can take away from um, the, sort of the problem of, you know, n not retiring soon enough? I don't know how to be nice, nice enough to say they need yeah. to get out of the way. Um, what, yeah. what, what are your thoughts there? I mean. I'll give them that legacy experience has value and they need to mentor, but what, what can we, how can we get them to move on and give them confidence that new thought is <laughs> going to be better than the old thought? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good question. <laughs> Sorry, <yeah. laughs> and I can tell you right, right now that that is not only specific to just the, the oh. your industry. Okay. So, so if, if that gives you any comfort, yeah, thank you. Least, uh, hopefully you yeah, because I'm one of those. Only... Yeah, I'm one of those that needs to move on. Okay, I, I know. <laughs> I, I know. I'm not happy with having all that. But but this this is the, the conversation that we must have. One is that we must change how we're positioning the, the exchange. We're making the exchange a a win lose or a lose lose proposition. Okay. We're saying, you go away, right? Uh, let someone else come in. I, I think one of the things that we need to do is to say, we want you to go take this higher level of position where you're playing more of a strategic advisory role and you're like the council of elders, if, if you know, for lack of a better word. Okay. And okay. allow, allow the, the, the kind of the new perspective, the diverse leaders to step in into those roles where they were probably in for the past 10, 15, 30 years, right? So it's an exchange. It's saying you go take on a more distinct role and opportunity while you give those who are behind you and have been knocking on the door and have been pushing and have been screaming, you give them more of an opportunity at the table. It means making the table bigger. It also means coming to the conversation with a sense of this is not an all-encompassing viewpoint that we have mm -hmm. and we want to have more diversity of thought, diversity of insight, diversity in terms of questions, diversity in terms of you know, possibilities and solutions. Because where we're going is actually in, in, in lack of better words like a wild, wild west, right? We need different types of thinkers, we need different yes. types of doers, we need different types of enablers. And that's where the hybrid uh, leadership is also helpful in in challenging people to say to think differently, and you know we celebrate the 
gradual assimilation of, I would say, female, more gender-focused uh, uh, inclusion. But I think there also needs to be a cultural inclusion as well, especially because of globalization and technology. Yes. You know, literally, we are connected, even though we're not in the same space. So why should our leadership be limited by space, right? Why, why and how can we leverage technology to allow us to have significant diversity of thought, solution, approach? Uh, I love how the open source is built, where multiple people can come to the same space and solve problems. So the hybrid premise is saying, look, get different kinds of people on the table. You know, don't, don't keep saying I'm waiting for the future. The future is now. The future yes. is there. Yes. People with diversity already here, bring them to the table, ask their opinion, engage them, step up a little bit, give them an opportunity, and watch, you know, in a lack of better word, watch your succession plan begin to take root without even you leaving as of here. Mm. But see the exchange as a win-win and not a lose-lose, right? So I think that's, that's what I, I will answer that question. I agree. Is is um, in your in your studies of leadership is that that thing I'm alluding to about guys not moving off soon enough? Is there is it fear of not being um, valid any longer? You know, is that a is that a component that, that makes them? I mean, you're I, I'm looking. I'm like you're 75. Go retire. You know, but they're still there. I don't. Is that are they afraid yeah. to not be relative, or is that a, a is that a psychological thing, or? I, I, so then, uh, I believe there is, there is that that's a play as well, mm. right? Okay. They, I think it's also human nature um, that is actually influencing a lot of kind of how people perceive uh, relevance. Uh, and, and the conversation and the challenge is that with advancement in health, with advancement in, you know, wellness, for example, uh, people who typically will have considered retirement at a certain age, say 60, 65, 70, and left you know, the room much earlier are still vibrant and young and able to do stuff that they, can, they were doing in their 50s. So there's this sense of why am I leaving when I'm still, I feel the same way I felt 20 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> okay. So, so there's, there's that dimension. So we've got to be able to look at that and say, let's, let's have that conversation around if the structure perhaps that we have today, was it designed effectively for where we are going, you know, where the 70s is now the new 50, and 90 is the new 70, and how might even the organizational structure support that heavy infusion of talent? Mm. So I think that's, that's part of the conversation that we need to have, and mm. to start to look to, do we need to scale decision making? Perhaps do we need to change the approach that we're using to come to the future? How do we develop leadership? How do we uh, in, embrace and allow the talent who feel stifled, uh, you know, from leaving our organization? So those are some of the dimensions. It might take a little bit of giving from some of the older folks um, so that they can retain and keep the younger folks. But I think it's a conversation on our behalf. And the honesty is that conversation is difficult. And in practice, as well as in my uh, profession, we're seeing that we need a lot of hand-holding, and that's where, you know, executive coaching comes into play, where we're holding people's hands and guiding them through that door. And say, look, keep walking with me. It's okay. It's going to be okay. Let's have ABC from this region. Let's have him from or uh, her from that state. Let's have this guy that we perhaps don't even know enough of uh, in terms of background. Let him also come to the table. Let's have a broader conversation. Hmm. So I think it's a gradual process. But it starts with the mindset that more people coming, diverse people coming, different people coming is actually a value add and not something you're taking away ah. uh, from them. Is um, <clears throat> I know there was a uh, there was a hashtag, you know, destroy the box, you know, and destroying the box. Mm -hmm. So I think in, originally my concept was that the box was was sort of structured by incumbents, you know, and incumbent known ways of an industry or a sector doing yeah. things the the way that they were done. But maybe yeah. maybe this box is simply communication and relationship and and that it's if if that's what opens up then the the, the structure and all is permeable or, or is destroyed in the just opening up the communication lines with the cross culture or you know next level of leaders or whatever it may be. Yeah. Is that yeah. um 
Actually, absolutely. So the box is actually a function of comfort. Right? <laughs> you, comfort, <and> yes. <laughs> because <laughs> the box is actually where we're all comfortable, right? Either as entrepreneurs or creators, we create, we walk you kind of the uncomfortable phase of abstract mm -hmm. uh, ideas. And when we get to a point where it's kind of a sweet spot, we've found our niche, we know what we do well, where people value us and pay us and whatnot. And then eventually, over time, we get very comfortable, and then we freeze. We get frozen into that box. Mm. And the challenge is great ideas, the great opportunities, the newer ways of doing things really occur outside the box. So intentionally, you know, and, and thank you for bringing that up, intentionally, I was challenging people to say, if you want to get to the next phase, you've got to get, get your hammer, get something, and start to shoot and start to break that comfort zone a little bit. Mm -hmm. you know, and you know, to your point, it comes to conversation. It comes to identifying the fact that you're in a comfortable place, right? You're in a safe place. You know what's expected of you. You know how to proceed with certain things. But when you get to that point, you limit potential possibilities. So you've got to disrupt that mm -hmm. through conversation, through reshuffling perhaps your organizational structure. It's through moving people perhaps who are more focus on sales, to take on a little bit of uh, customer service or back-end support, is moving people from accounting to say, look, go be front-facing to the client, is taking people into a conversation around and introducing perhaps a, a different speaker from a different cultural dimension to talk about technology, for example, and say, okay, how do you use technology in your space or in your country or in your culture or in your context? And really fostering the conversation. The more you do that, the more you're able to flex and kind of reshape the box and you keep moving it, you keep moving it. And one thing I must say about the box is if you reward, promote, and encourage people who are within the box, forget the box. People are not going to try to walk outside the box because the reward structure favors those who are within. So people will go within. So you've got to support that. It's not just talk, it's also with actions as well. Awesome. Dr. Falai, thank you so much. And so for my industry out there, destroy the box. The future's global mm. and it's now. Hybrid Leadership Institute, do some reading, check it out. We need change in our industry because many of the things we've been doing haven't worked. It's very important that we destroy that box for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Falai, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we'll see you guys next week on Security Matters. Aloha.